our uh, first speaker sort of uh, who did gave the the challenge in her, in, in her impassioned talk about uh, concerns about ethical issues and uh, our next speaker is uh, Jen McCormick who uh, is now assistant professor of bioethics biomedical ethics at Mayo Clinic um, and and her next uh, she's also helping to plan the individualized uh, medicine uh, uh, clinic at Mayo uh, I think a very exciting but but uh, ethics uh, laden uh, challenge. Um, Jen got a, a PhD in biology at the University of Michigan, and then went and got a, a, a master's in public policy at the University of Michigan, and and uh, worked very much with Homer in in designing the, his course and writing his book, and so we're pleased to uh, invite her back. So. Um, it's a pleasure, always a pleasure, to be back in Ann Arbor. Um, and as uh, Carl um, noted, I do a lot at Mayo Clinic in the context of the individualized medicine clinic, so translational genomics and genetics. But another role I have at the Mayo Clinic is uh, directing, I have the honor, um, I guess you could say, of directing our a course on responsible conduct of research. Um, I also serve on our research ethics consultation service and, and, and am a member of our, the Office of Ethical Conduct of Research. So because of that, um, I think the, the organizers of the symposium asked me to talk about you know, how, how do universities or how should universities mobilize to play a larger role in national science policy in the context of research ethics and integrity. So, you know, this is something I think about a lot. Um, and I think we can all, you know, kind of reflect on our um, backgrounds and think about some of the different ways in which we've learned along, along the way um, about right and wrong. Um, and so this may set us up for saying, so why do we even really need to worry about thinking about research ethics and integrity um, in the context of science policy, in the context of research? Well, I would like to say, and maybe this is because of my background, um, having trained as a scientist and then a little bit of policy and then going on to do some biomedical ethics and policy, that ethics is really part of the, poli uh, part of the package. I mean, you know, we like to think of science for policy and in that context, we're hoping, I mean, you know, we're using good science, scientific evidence, but we're also balancing that with societal values. On the other hand, we have to think about policies for science, and when we look back through history, some of our policies for science, um, you know, when we look at why we have these, these compliance, these regulations, they're really largely based on some, you know, ir acts of irresponsibility, lapses in integrity, or ethical conduct in research. And, I, you know, it's, it's good to be aware of, of the history in the past to see how we've gotten to where we are. And I, I think, you know, myself at, at Mayo, even though I'm not doing bench research, I still do research. And I, I, I think we have to balance this idea of um, having too much compliance uh, that can actually burden us and prevent us from our research. So, so, you know, all of these things kind of come together in thinking about why ethics is, is important to have in this discussion. I think another piece, um, we heard about this a lot yesterday, and I would emphasize it uh, again today, is that you know, trust is really critical to the scientific process. Um, it, it's not just, it, you know, trust within the scientific community. I have a quote from Bruce Alberts and Kenneth Schein from, you know, about 20 years ago. The scientific, and they noted, the scientific research enterprise is built on a foundation of trust. Trust that the results reported by others are valid and trust that the source of novel ideas will be appropriately acknowledged in the scientific literature. I think what they were trying to say is really, you know, we can't do science if we can't trust one another and trust what is out in the literature. We also heard a lot yesterday about how public trust is really critical to um, our process of science. And I, when I'm teaching um, students at Mayo, I always point out that, you know, we have to earn that trust. We as scientists have to be trustworthy. You know, there's a lot of trustworthiness in this, in this, um, in this gaining the trust. And I think to some extent, all that, that trust, trustworthiness relationship 
is maybe a little fragile, and we have to be acknowledge that it is fragile, and we can't just take it for granted. Why is it fragile? Well, I think you know we could talk about a lot of different things, but one of the things, you know, we're seeing in the headlines a lot, um, more and more cases on research misconduct and fraud. And I, you know, just kind of pulled out a few of these here. Um, you know, a big one that we're all aware of is, you know, the retraction from Wakefield on the, on the, the virus, uh, vaccines and autism. But, you know, it's, it's not without, a, you know, a week where you can't have some, some headline hitting some newspaper, um, either giving an update on a case or um, reporting on a conclusion. In an article that was published in the um, PNA Net, PNAS in 2012, uh, Fang et al. actually did a systematic review and in their findings, I'll, I'll read this, what they found, uh, they did a detailed review of all 2047 biomedical and life science research articles indexed by PubMed as retracted on May 3rd, 2012 revealed that only 21.3% of the retractions were attributable to error. In contrast, over 67% of the retractions were attributable to misconduct, including fraud or suspected fraud, duplication, duplicate publication, or plagiarism. The percentage of scientific articles retracted because of fraud has increased approximately tenfold since 1975. And that's only in the biomedical sciences. And that's only the fraud and misconduct that we've, that we've actually discovered. So I, I think this kind of goes back to my point about trust. Trust within the scientific community and as well as trust of, you know, trust the public has in us. Both of those, I think, are, um, you know, things we have to be very we're, uh, careful to protect. So the other thing that's coming up in the context of, of science and that's getting a lot of attention is this idea of questionable behaviors. So research misconduct, for those of you who may not be aware of this, is really narrowly defined to falsification, fabrication, and plagiarism. There are rules and regulations um, set aside to deal with those. And you know those, those cases do happen, um, un unfortunately. Um, I think there are many cases that we miss, but more and more scientists, you can go into the literature, a lot of my colleagues have done some work on this as well as myself, where researchers and those involved in research administration are really becoming concerned about what we call as questionable behaviors. And this is just a list here that I, I put up of some that I've heard from students and scientists alike. Assigning authors, cleaning or handling data, Recording or reporting methods. So, you know, are we reporting everything that we, absolutely everything we did in our notebooks when, we're, when we do a, a study and then reporting that in the literature? Cleaning and handling data goes back to, you know, this, this, this point, data point out here that may be an, an, seem like an anomaly. Can we just drop it or can we not drop it? Statistical, using use of statistical analyses. I have a colleague who does um, a lot of biostatistics consult, consultation at Mayo Clinic, and he's often complaining about investigators coming in and wanting to dabble around in different statistical methods to get the answer that they think they want to have. Um, mentoring, fiscal responsibility, personal relationships, nine financial conflict of interest. These are all things that we also, just because we don't have regulations, we also have to be aware of these. And I think they, they come into being really critical to how we think about the policies that govern how we do science and how we do science in general. So these questionable behaviors, and this is really particularly highlighted in the biomedical sciences, um, you know, we're, we're hearing a lot about the lack of ability to reproduce studies. Um, there have been a number of editorials in high-profile journals about this, this issue. Um, and Glenn Begley and Lee Ellis wrote uh, an article in um, 2012 in Nature. And in that, they, you know, they, they kind of gave some suggestions as how what we need to do to, to, 
to try to correct for this. And they pointed to poor design, poor analysis as contributing to this lack of irreproducibility, failure to direct hypotheses after observing discordant valid experimental results, bias towards positive rather than negative results in reporting and publishing, and the lack of asking the question, why is this not what I expected, and due diligence and follow, to follow up. They went on to say that you know, some of this, we actually may be creating ourselves. Um, you know, they pointed to the academic system and peer review process, that it to these systems tolerate and perhaps even inadvertently encourage this type of conduct. To obtain funding, a job, promotion, or tenure, researchers need a strong publication record, often including a first authored high impact pub publication. So th what's coming out in this is, yes, we have the research misconduct happening. Yes, we have these questionable behaviors that we're becoming to become, to be a little more concerned about, and all of this may be leading to what in the Boston Globe um, in a two, recent 2015 article noted as a, a quiet crisis. Um, and in that, the Carolyn Johnson, who authored this article, noted that um, the White House Office of OSTP mentioned in a 2014 um, uh, workshop a request for public com com comments on innovation strategy, saying, given recent evidence of the irreproducibility of a surprising number of published, published scientific findings, how can the federal government leverage its role as a scientific funder of scientific research to most effectively address the problem? So clearly, all of these things are leading up to thinking about, you know, national science policy issues and you know it's, we're pulling in the the people who think about these to address this um, the issues of research and um, integrity ethics and integrity in research so finally a, another you know another snapshot of this was in the economist and this you know both the globe and the economist article are going to point to the fact that it's not just scientists who are aware of this but the public are becoming more aware of this um, in this article the the author point suggested that integrity um, should be defined much broader than just simply research misconduct which again going back to what the technical definition is fabrication falsification and plagiarism um, and that some of this, this, the problems that we're seeing, again going back to the, 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 the Nature article, is this idea of this, this, the system in w that we've created. There's increasing competition, there's a focus on careerism, and there's exclusivity. So not sharing findings, not clearly reporting our methods and procedures. So, you know, what we've done in the past is largely focus on what we I might consider um, the bad apple narrative for explaining deviant behavior in research. So thinking about it as you know psychopathology, you simply have bad people, a few bad people, the one or two bad apple in the barrel, um, and these are people who intentionally engage in deviant behavior. And in this may be tr this is. This is probably true, um, but I think we probably need to start thinking about um, not necessarily the, the bad apple, but to looking at the tree or the soil from which the apple comes. And this is a, an approach, um, three approaches outlined by Silvacol in 2008. And he actually, he took, or pointed to the individual's lack of integrity, um, which we can, do a lot with that in having courses on responsible conduct of research and integrity, but he also pointed to some larger issues, and those are institutional issues that may be threatening integrity, intentionally or unintentionally, probably mostly unintentionally, and systematic issues or structural aspects within the research enterprise that may, um, again, unintentionally um, promote these um, lapses of integrity. So again, you know, how, what, what should we do about all this? Well, yesterday we heard a lot about increasing calls for engagement. And I think 
Um, I, I think in this context of the issues around misconduct and, and lack of integrity and irreproducibility, the engagement is really pretty important. Um, I think when we're scientists, we have to think about having several obligations. We have a responsibility to be true to the scientific process in the scientific community, but we also have a responsibility to society, to meet societal needs, um, but also to talk with non-scientists about what we do and why we do that. Um, and Toby referenced, and I think a few others did, the civic scientist. And one of the things, I use Neil Lane's civic scientist model a lot in the teaching I do. And but one of the things I emphasize, if you really look at what he said when he defined the civic scientist, he pointed to the fact that it's an active dialogue. It's not simply a monologue with scientists educating, but it's an active dialogue with scientists listening to concerns about, uh, from the public about what they do. Now, you know, we had, uh, this was mentioned earlier today and then yesterday as, as well, this, well, you know, only certain people can be civic scientists. And I would argue that there can be, just like the people who were talking about it this morning earlier, um, there are many types of civic scientists and there are many ways to be civic scientists. You can be a civic scientist by engaging with policymakers um, or being involved in the policymaking process. You can be someone who's you know, very important and very senior in your career and have the opportunity to speak to large public forums, to speak to advocacy groups. But I think it's also to, important to acknowledge and recognize that just by talking to your neighbor about what you do and why you do that is being a civic scientist. Or to your grandma or your grandpa or Uncle Bill and Aunt Lois. I have an Uncle Bill and an Aunt Lois, and I talk to them a lot about what I do and why I do it. To your seat partner on a Delta flight, and the list goes on and on. So being a civic scientist is, I, I think this reflects what, what um, a number of people were saying, it's not that difficult, and it doesn't take being you know, a major important person in your field to do that. What I think is important, though, when we talk about being a civic scientist, is that you know, going back to Neil Lane's um, definition of a civic scientist, it's you know, stepping beyond your campus, campuses, laboratories, ministries, and institutes into the center of your communities to engage in active dialogue with your fellow citizens, considering, considering them fellow citizens, and that you can learn from them as well. Getting rid of the esoteric details. They don't need the esoteric details. Don't get caught up in the esoteric details. And then also, being willing to hear and consider criticisms and different ways of thinking. All of these are very critical to being a, a, a civic scientist and to supporting and, and continuing this research um, enterprise. So some more suggestions. I think, you know, we teach responsible conduct of research. We've been doing it since 1993, but we really don't know its effectiveness. Um, and I think what we really need to do is identify what it can and can't do. And rather than maybe even thinking about responsible conduct of research as a one-shot deal, because typically it's taught to first or second year grad students, we need to integrate ethical conduct and opportunities to have discussions about challenges that scientists are facing on their day-to-day -day basis throughout their career, um, starting with undergraduates, and integrated, and at different points in an individual's career, there are going to be different challenges and, and different um, uh, decision points that they have to, um, to consider in the context of ethical, critical ethical thinking. And I think it's important to integrate those across the career. Um, I think we also have to remember that compliance is not ethics. Responsible conduct of research, as it is now often, is really about the rules and the regulations. And it's not about digging deep as to why we have those rules and regulations. And there's not a lot of encouragement to examine broad policy and social implications of the research we, we do. Um, and including and really pushing this idea, the social responsibility and this civic engagement is really a part of being you know, a responsible, ethical um, scientist. 
So, you know, a quote from John Beckwith, you know, I'm not the first person to say that we should be having this training um, with grad students throughout um, their training. Um, and as he points out, you know, if we want scientists to be more critical thinkers, then preparing them to be engaged in looking critically at the social implications of their science can only aid in achieving that goal. So more suggestions. I think we need to evaluate the current system of the scientific research enterprise rather than focusing so much on the bad apple, thinking about the tree and the soil um, and how that may or may not be um, uh, unintentionally um, promoting um, some of these lapses of integrity that we're seeing. And I think we need to move the debate about ethics, professionalism, and social responsibility beyond the implementation of protocols and laboratories and institutions to these broader social, societal, ethical issues. So concluding comments. Being a scientist involves not only knowledge and expertise, but also the virtues of altruism, trustworthiness, and integrity. A potential implication is loss of trust within and outside the scientific community. And I think all of these things are really kind of integrated in with teaching and bringing science policy into the university as well. So with that. So our next speaker uh, was uh, also there at the beginning uh, planning this meeting uh, probably uh, many, many months ago. It's. Uh, uh, Vasubi, La, Vasubidan uh, Lakshan Arai Anan. Uh, and uh, one of the things uh, Vasu had done was to uh, get one of his, encourage one of his students to apply to the uh, STPP program. So I'm going to ask Liz Dreyer, who can pronounce his name much better than I can, who knows better what uh, Vasu does, to finish the introduction. Thanks, Carl. So hi, everybody. I'm Liz Dreyer, but uh, I want to introduce uh, your next speaker, Vasudevan Lakshmiaranian. Uh, he, um, in many people go by only one names. You may know them as Cher or Oprah. In optics, everybody knows Vangu. So just call him Vangu. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting Vangu when he was a visiting professor last year, uh, going, uh, going through University of Michigan. He dabbled as an experimentalist in my optics lab, and I've gotten to know him a lot more through the International Year of Light uh, celebration and policy initiative that's going on this year. Uh, but Vangu will tell you more about that, so I don't want to take any more time. Vangu. Thank you. It's a, it's a real pleasure for me to be here in Ann Arbor talking to you, especially at the Rackham uh, Graduate School building, because about 30 years ago when I was applying to grad schools, um, Rackham Physics actually not only admitted me, but also gave me a Rackham Fellowship, which I turned down uh, to go to Berkeley, and maybe, just maybe, I made a mistake in doing that, having experienced Ann Arbor. Full screen. Yes. It's over here, I think. You see it there? Yeah, yeah one of the. Oh, wait, Mums. Where is that? Where? No, there it is. Go there, yeah. Good. And uh, let's see. Oh, this is different from on my Mac. Uh, we'll just do that. Yeah. Is it? Okay. Hola. Yes. Um, so I'm really happy to be here, and it's been a distinct uh, privilege for me to work with Homer and the other distinguished members of the organizing committee for the Wiesner Symposium. Um, let's see. I'm going to talk about uh, our globalization of science when Jerome Wiesner, in Jerome Wiesner's time, uh, you know, which was at the height of the Cold War, you know, the, the world was divided into essentially three worlds, the us and the West, the Soviet Union and its allies, and the so-called third world. And however, that is not true now, and science and engineering is increasingly globalized, and um, I've been one of these 10 percenters, as James Wells and John Holden put it, I've been involved with uh, global science policy. I've had the privilege and the honor of representing the US, and two different IUPAP General Assemblies, as well as being 
the chair of the International Commission on Optics Committee. So I've been quite involved with this. And then for SPIE, one of the professional societies, I uh, chair the Developing Nations Committee in terms of education and science policy. So science and engineering is increasingly globalized, and it's a world that Jerome Wiesner would not recognize because we have much greater communication, much greater mobility, and we all know that it is globalized by looking at our campuses, looking at the number of foreign students and visitors on our campuses. However, uh, globalization is not entirely new. In fact, in the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society, the oldest scientific publication dating back to 1665, Henry Oldenburg uh, shared his journal with the, uh, as the happy inventions of the obliging man, men all, all, all over the world to the general benefit of mankind. And in fact, in the uh, early journal, uh, there were ideas from Germany, Italy, France, Hungary, and even the Bermudas, which was a British colony at that time, as well as uh, from the UK. Now, later on, Louis Pasteur said, knowledge belongs to humanity, and thus science knows no country and is the torch that illuminates the world. That is pretty much true now, even though our science is increasingly, increasingly uh, 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 globalized, it's still nation-based in terms of funding, uh, but there's greater mobility, there is uh, greater cooperation, uh, sharing of research facilities such as CERN that we all know about, or the upcoming uh, ITER, the, uh, the Fusion Energy Project, uh, the International Space Station. So there is a lot of globalization. And so science is a worldwide endeavor. For example, in 2008, 218 countries produced over a, a million and a half research papers published in journals. Tuvalu in the South Pacific published one. I mean, it's a country with about 15,000 people and 10 square miles in area. To the UK is almost 100,000, China is 163,000, and we did about 320,000. Uh, the amount of money countries spend on, of their GDP on science varies from Sweden which is one of the highest in the world. Uh, Canada spent about uh, 2%. India spent about 8 tenths of a percent. And of course, the oil-rich Saudi Arabia spent less than half a percent. Over the past uh, many decades, we have averaged between 2 to 3% of our GDP on science. Now, it should also be noted, <clears throat> in fact, this chart shows you the average good as a share of GDP uh, as a function of, uh, of uh, you know, the number of uh, growth of the uh, growth of GDP. And here we are, and Sweden is way up, up there. Finland spends quite a bit of its GDP on, uh, on uh, R&D funding. Um, given all of that, where do we go? Now, if you, uh, we are falling behind, and we all recognize it. For example, uh, if you look at the GDP, uh, uh, the funding of gross expenditures on R&D, and here I don't mean just by the government, but by uh, uh, private corporations, by uh, philanthropic uh, institutes, uh, like, for example, the Gates Foundation and so on, we are up here. The, uh, the solid line is us. Uh, there are, you know, other countries that do uh, 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 below us, and there are other countries that do much, much better than us. And for, and for example, you can see China's growth. Uh, now, in terms of just in uh, our country, in terms of trends in federal R&D, this is from the AAAS, and uh, you can see the data, the total amount of the GDP spent by the uh, United States federal government on R&D is roughly, you know, right now we are about 1% of the total GDP. Defense spending takes a lot more uh, compared to non-defense spending. Now, how do we compare in terms of uh, research? There are two things we can look at. I mean, if you want to look at metrics, an easy metric that we can use is obviously the number of papers published and the league tables on uh, 
since most of our research is done in universities in terms of where our universities rank and uh, with respect to other universities around the world, we produce about 20% of the world's authorship on papers. This is data from 2012 so much. Um, we dominate the world uh, tables, whether it is the Chinese uh, rankings or the, I'm not talking about uh, US News and World Report, but the Times of London uh, educational supplement rankings or the CW uh, uh, rankings and so on. We dominate the world university tables. For example, uh, the uh, London Times uh, rankings that came out maybe a, a few weeks ago uh, says that you know, Harvard is number one, uh, Cambridge is two and Oxford is three, then comes, uh, I believe, Stanford and Berkeley and so on. But out of the top 10, you know, we dominate by having eight of the top 10 universities. I believe Michigan is somewhere like number 15, but Michigan is in the top 20, definitely. Uh, and um, in the top 100 universities in the world, the United States has about 43 of them. It's slightly down from before, but still, and the UK comes next. Uh, UK, Japan, and Germany, and France are other major players. And these five countries together are responsible for almost 60% of all spending on science globally. However, we need to watch out for a few things. Science has, uh, has increased. This tells you uh, data from 2002 and 2007. 2002, the amount of spending, uh, sp amount of money spent on science and engineering was around $790 billion. Now it's so almost, uh, you know, 1.2 billion, uh, 1.145. Uh, the average for the world as such has not changed very much. It's, it's the same, about 1.7% of the world GDP. But what you have to realize is that the world GDP has increased a lot in that intervening five years. And the number of people who claim, who, who claim that research is their profession has gone up by almost uh, from 5.7 to 7.1 million and the number of publications has also dramatically increased. So, what is the proportion of publication authorship by country? If you look at the top 10, this is us, about 26% uh, in 1999 to 2003. And right now, we have fallen by about 5%, okay, in terms of total number of papers published by American researchers, I'll, I'll tell a bit more about that, but who have a United States address. Uh, you can look at, uh, look at other countries. They're very similar. Japan's publications are a lot in engineering and development. Uh, but in general, there has been you know, uh, uh, a slight change for Japan and UK and so forth. Uh, so the United States is pretty much you know, constant, this is just science and engineering articles. The European Union is up there, a little bit above us. And the rest of the world is out here, not including Japan, China, and India. But if you compare the total of Asia, the total number of papers being published from Asia, the emerging countries of China and India, to be more precise, uh, they have pretty much overtaken us. If you look at engineering articles, uh, Asia goes far above us. Okay, red again is the US. This is in pure engineering. This is a very busy uh, chart, but it shows you the science in the G20 as well as their uh, GDP. You know, the annual growth in GDP is shown here, and this is the total amount of uh, science uh, uh, being done. And this refers to the number of publications, increase in publications. And we are out here in terms of total growth in GDP. And uh, look at these big charts here. The, this is China. So <coughs> uh, uh, if you study these charts, you find that between 1996 and two, 2008, 
we lost about 20% of the world's article authorship. Japan lost about 22, Russia 24%. The other countries also fell back. So the traditional scientific leaders, the big five that I mentioned, lost their share of published articles. But China increased its publications that it's now the second highest producer of research output in the world. Now the quality is something that we can discuss about. Now, India has become large. It has replaced the Russian Federation in the top 10. Uh, further down our countries are the other Asian tigers, such as South Korea and Singapore. Then Brazil and Turkey come in also. Within the EU, small countries like Austria, Greece, and Portugal have improved their standings. Now, China is poised to outpace US in R&D spending sometime around 2019. So these uh, show you what is happening with China and also with the US and the EU, 28 countries of the EU. Now, <coughs> this again is from a different set of data. This is from OECD that again shows you where we stand in terms of R&D spending. Here's the US, about 468 compared to 801 in billions of dollars. However, in terms of the top 1% uh, from scientific citations, the top cited articles, we still have, we are way up here. This is all, all branches of science, while China is edging forward, EU is pretty much static. But the crucial thing we need to note is science is conducted in more places than ever before, and it's more interlinked. Now, it turns out that almost one-third of published scientific papers are because of international collaboration with the author's addresses from more than one country. And the number of internationally co-authored papers has doubled, more than doubled since 1990. And of course, we all know what heavy travel schedules we have. There's a lot more traveling because we want to work with the best possible co-authors, best possible colleagues anywhere, access to facilities. And not only that, there's a lot more cross-border spending from international organizations, including businesses. Uh, businesses, for example, go to where they think they can get a bigger bang for the buck. IBM, an American company headquartered in New York, has not only Yorktown Heights and IBM San Jose, but they got a major lab in Japan, they got a major lab in, uh, in Switzerland, which gave rise to you know, the AFM, two Nobel Prizes. Microsoft is not only in, uh, in uh, Washington, but they got a research center in uh, Hyderabad, India. GE has a big uh, research lab in Bangalore and in Shanghai. So people, uh, businesses put their money where they think they're going to get the biggest return on investment, where the people are. There are multilateral initiatives between governments and research agencies, multinational funding bodies, and of course shared infrastructure that I mentioned about. Now, the architecture of world science is also changing. Uh, they involve networks of individuals, mostly self-organized, but sometimes orchestrated. For example, the Human Genome Project. There was no one central place, but people were connected by computers. People worked in the US, in, in um, uh, Cambridge, England, and elsewhere. And some of those are big international facilities like CERN. And, I, and then I told you about uh, you know, international, multinational businesses or by foundations such as the Gates Foundation or cross-national infrastructure such as the EU. So these significantly exert a much more, uh, uh, in, uh, in a much more ex influence on the conduct of science across the world. Now this is an interesting uh, curve uh, because this bar graph essentially shows you the percentage of single author papers in, in various fields uh, in 1981 and 2012. This excludes review papers, which are many times written by single authors. And you notice that the number of multi-authored papers 
has really gone down. This is across various disciplines. There are more co-authors, there's more collaboration. And in fact, <clears throat> this is from uh, the uh, science indicators that shows you in terms of how many world and US academic science and engineering articles are co-authored domestically and internationally. If you look at uh, all authorship, let's just look at US papers, you know, all co-authorship goes up. Domestic co-authorship is pretty much flat, but the number of international co-authorship goes up. This is partly due to the large numbers of foreign students we have, foreign visitors, postdocs, and so forth. And this is a trend not just for us, but for the rest of the world, too. And this, uh, this graph shows you the share of the science and engineering articles internationally co-authored by se selected countries between 2002 to 2012. So, uh, okay. Um, uh, let me skip over the next few. One can also do these charts showing, you know, the number of cross connections between various countries, various authors, and the thickness of the line, and, and uh, uh, you know, shows you how these connections extend, but unfortunately I don't have time to go into this. And this basically shows you, for example, uh, uh, you know, collaboration between Brazil, Russia, and India from 96 to 2000. And now if you look at these collaborations with the G7 countries, so there's more and more complexity in this. And, uh, and also the top 20 uh, publishing cities around the world have also changed. For here are uh, you know, uh, some of the usual suspects, LA, and I'm surprised you know, the Bay Area, San Francisco is not in there. But there are newer cities up, out here which did not exist uh, uh, you know, back in 1996, which has shown major growth. So, uh, let me continue on. So, my conclusions are, science is uh, uh, increasingly global. There is increased activity in some places, which is very striking. The traditional powers still lead, but it's an, but it's an increasingly multipolar scientific world. It's more interconnected, and the primary drivers are the scientists themselves. So what does a big university like Michigan have to do, or United States in terms of national science policy? Uh, someone mentioned, I think it was uh, Dr. Cousins this morning, in terms of immigration policies, in terms of making it easier for uh, H-1B visas for scholars. Uh, uh, we have been very lucky as a country in that many of the students we trained from abroad elected to stay here and contribute to this country. But that's not the case now. Many of them are going back because there are so many uh, uh, roadblocks to them becoming, getting a green card and becoming citizens. Uh, we have got to have more openness. There are a number of regulations in terms of what things foreign students can work on or have access to or cannot. So there's a whole, and there's got to be a cultural shift too. Diversity is good. Diversity of peoples from around the world brings about a greater diversity of thought. And uh, you know, uh, we live in a multicultural world and we need to accept it. And so I'll stop with that. I think you are ready to get me out of here. So thank you. So it's uh, very natural to uh, conclude our speakers, both for this afternoon and for the conference with uh, Homer Neal. Homer is the uh, Samuel uh, Goodsmith University Professor of Physics. He uh, had a, 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 a very effective reign as the Vice President of Research for the University of Michigan and also as Interim President of the University. Uh, he teaches a course uh, on uh, national science policy, has written a book, uh, uh, Beyond Sputnik, uh, U.S. Science Policy in the 21st Century. Homer, the podium is thine. Well, thank you very much for the introduction, Carl. I have only, let's get closer. Yes. Okay. Thanks for the introduction, and uh, I just wanted to say that there are three very, uh, well, potentially short uh, topics I'd like to raise. Uh, they are not straightforward. And it, 
I'll be particularly interested in hearing what uh, members of the audience have to say about them. One of, one of them, let's see, is this question of whether uh, science policy should be considered uh, in the university context uh, as part of a liberal arts education. Um, I've talked to colleagues. Many uh, think it should be, and certainly some think it shouldn't be. Um, I went to Webster and uh, uh, Britannica to see what the general definition is of uh, a liberal arts uh, uh, curriculum. Uh, this is what Web Webster says. Normally you don't put into a liberal arts curriculum something that is specifically, uh, would, would prepare you for a specific uh, vocation or professional uh, line of work. Based on um, certainly my experience of teaching first in physics and then in the Ford School, um, a course on science policy, uh, I come down on the side of the subject being a liberal arts, um, uh, certainly qualifying for a liberal arts treatment. It does prepare our students to go into life regardless of what they are going to do, but to understand how research is funded, what the structures are in government that make R&D support uh, possible. Uh, the history in the field is extremely rich. As a matter of fact, some of the discussions today, I'm you know, just going back to the beginning of uh, the NSF, for example, uh, one of the questions was, so sh should social sciences be included in the National Science Foundation? And it's just very interesting to read the give and take. And I think, you know, they got it right at the beginning. It's too bad that the issue comes up every now and then, but clearly the social sciences should be included. And if you want to ask, when does a student get exposed to that argument? Well, a natural place is a science policy class. Um, the public understanding of science, public appreciation of science, that's all part of our courses. And you might ask, well, what's, what's the problem? Why would you, Homer, well, inter interrupt uh, a wonderful conference like this to uh, raise this issue? Well, because it's, it's an active issue on our campus. Um, engineering, for example, includes uh, science policy as a uh, potential uh, distribution course for its students. But our larger college, uh, Co College of Literature, Science, and the Arts, does not. Um, and an issue like that is worthy of reflection. To find out, you know, what, it, it could even be that it, different schools, different universities will have a different take on uh, this question. And uh, it's not clear that every university should uh, do the same thing. But in a world where as we go forward, science and technology are going to be uh, increasingly important in our lives, um, and we're a democratic society, citizens will be asked to vote on all kinds of things in the decades ahead. 
Wouldn't it be a pity if they don't even know what NIH stands for? Uh, or NSF or DOE and so on. Uh, so I, I did look at the dictionary. This, this is what Webster says. This is what Britannica says. And of course, we can ignore all of these, but at least I wanted a, uh, a starting point. And the last sentence or so sort of lays out the general areas, humanities, fine arts, and the physical and biological sciences, mathematics, and the social sciences. And so, so I guess I would argue that, uh, well, I've already said this, more and more decisions in our democratic society will be based on science and technology. And we should send our graduates out, I believe, knowing the basics of, uh, well, for example, research integrity. Where do our undergraduate students hear about that? the topic that Jen just uh, talked about. And so the, I think there is a good enough case for any university or all universities to consider how they want to handle uh, courses on science policy. Um, you know, the difference between basic and applied research, where's that talked about? And, you know, in history, I, I think Ralph maybe had mentioned it the other day, so many of our uh, big research labs, you know, Bell Labs, discovery of the transistor and things of that nature that transformed our society. Well, Mergers and acquisitions have changed that picture. So students interested in uh, business and those areas should hear about our loss of the uh, Sarnoff Laboratory, Bell Laboratories, and the list goes on. And in the military con con complex, uh, you go looking for Grumman aircraft, for example, now. You won't find it because it's, uh, um, it's either eaten up something else or has been eaten. Um, Irem, just uh, down on Plymouth Road here, I, I served on the board of it for a while, but then one day it disappeared. Uh, got eaten up by uh, Verizon, no, not uh, Viridian, yes. And then it got eaten up by general dynamics. Uh, so it's, uh, so if you're interested in business, it, this is a wonderful area to see motions uh, taking, taking place that sometimes um, presumably is helpful, sometimes it's not. Pfizer used to be here. We pinned a lot of our hopes on uh, interactions between the university and Pfizer. Well, Pfizer had gobbled up Warner Lambert, I believe, and then it left town. Okay, so that's item number one. Um, the second item has to do, I mean, it wasn't posted with this topic, but I think uh, during discussion, we might want to ask ourselves, should we say something about exposing our students to experiences, um, oh, international research experiences? Clearly, science and research is headed uh, toward uh, uh, collaboration, collaboration with those in other countries. And uh, uh, universities are not doing enough to provide these opportunities to our students. 
No, I'll speak uh, just uh, directly from experience in high energy physics. Uh, the, United, the United States used to be the leader in that area. We had a wonderful distribution of national laboratories. Uh, but now the Center for High Energy Physics is in Geneva. Uh, SLAC, Stanford uh, University <coughs> Linear Accelerator, um, is not the laboratory it used to be. It used to be a major um, center for training of undergraduates, well, in, in addition to, of course, doing outstanding physics. Um, the Tevatron at Fermilab outside of Chicago has been closed. And as a uh, faculty uh, member who, at least at present, has the resources to go to Geneva, this is where many of us spend most of our time, what happens, I mean, we can go, but there are very few opportunities for students to go. So we have students here um, in the United States, many of them wanting to go uh, to the cutting edge of, of the field and see how it's done and decide whether they want to go into the field. Now they're just uh, diminishing oppor opportunities to take students uh, to Geneva, for example. And many researchers won't do it if they have to spend $15,000 to take a, center, a student to, to Geneva for a few weeks. They'll just take that money and hire you know, another half of a postdoc. Um, so I think that's an issue uh, that if you're a leading university like Michigan and you can't take your brightest students to Geneva, there's something wrong. Um, and nobody seems to feel responsibility for that. Uh, I, I did have a brief conversation with France about it. And uh, we, could, we couldn't think of a way uh, to solve this problem. By the way, the REU program, which is which covers the summer, that's one thing that exists. Michigan has been the, uh, the primary uh, uh, portal for U.S. students to go to Geneva. They apply to us. We select a group of students. We send the list of names to CERN. The NSF gives us the money, and we, and we take 15 students each summer. But what I'm talking about now is what about the academic year? Um, so that's another topic. And the third one, I think I'll stop and maybe raise it during the discussion period.